Hi everyone, this is Casey here. Hope you're ready for another awesome video lesson. This one is section 14.2 about limits, but in particular limits using algebraic techniques, including the technique of rationalization. Before we start the new idea though, we're gonna just quickly review the basic idea of substitution to solve limits that you should have learned in yesterday's video. So I don't want to cram. Okay, so for each of these problems, you're just going to substitute the number in to see what you get as an answer, right? So the first one, we put 4 in and you get 16 minus 10 over 4 plus 2. That gives us 4, sorry, 6 over 6, which is 1. Done. Pretty easy. Next one. Also substituting four into the problem and we get 16 minus 16 over four plus two, which gives us zero over six, which happens to be zero. Done. Last one here, when we put four into this one, we get 16 minus 16 over four minus four, which gives us zero over zero, which does not equal zero. Okay, that is probably one of the biggest mistakes that students make is they get zero down here in the denominator. They sometimes will immediately say it does not exist or they see zero in the numerator and they immediately think it's equal to zero and neither one of those things are true. This is what's called an indeterminate form. which is going to be the primary focus of today's lesson, figuring out how to solve these limits, okay? Before we actually do that, though, I have one other type of problem I want us, or one other type of problem from yesterday I want us to review. So these problems right here, this is something where you're given some functions that you don't know what they are, right? They're just random functions, and you want to use basic algebra techniques to figure out the answers to the limits below. So I have these two limits, both going to 5. One's f of x, one's g of x. One's value is negative 6, and the other one is 2. And you always want to make sure that the limits approach the same value as the original information, otherwise you wouldn't be able to do the problem. And you're basically going to substitute negative 6 in where there's an f of x, and 2 in where there's a g of x. So this first one becomes negative 6 over 2 squared, which is negative 6 over 4 or negative 3 over 2. The second one, you are also going to put a 2 in for g of x, but you're going to substitute the 5 in for the x as well. So we have to put the 5 into that x, then this part becomes 2, and then the whole thing minus 3. So 125 times 2 minus 3. Usually I do these problems in class so that I don't have to do multiplication and division myself and accidentally make a mistake. But I do think that is 250 minus 3, which is 247. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and move on to that thing that I was calling the indeterminate form. Here it is. You should have space on your paper to write something like this. So some limits can be evaluated by direct substitution. Those are the ones that we did that had nice numeric values. Okay, but it doesn't work for all functions. Like the one we did on that first screen, it was x squared minus 16 over x minus 4. Or was it x plus 4? Doesn't matter. Um, if I have a plus 4 here, no. Sorry, you guys. I'm pretty sure it was minus. Okay, so here we are. When we put this in, just like this x squared minus 9 over x minus 3, if you just substitute it directly in, you get 0 over 0, which gives you this thing that's called an indeterminate form. So what you're going to want to do is do some sort of algebraic manipulation to solve the limit. So we'll actually do both of these so you can see what I'm talking about. So this first one here, the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 9, I'm going to factor that x squared minus 9. And then I'll be able to cancel the x minus 3s, just like you would do if you were looking for a hole in the problem, because that's actually what this limit is. And so now you can take that 3 
and substitute it into whatever's left over. So when I put three in there, I get six. So basically what this is telling us is that there's a hole in this function at three comma six. But all we really care about right now for this unit is just the fact that you get the limit to be equal to six. So then I could do the same thing on this problem over here. So this would factor into x minus four times x plus four. And then I can cancel out the x minus fours and substitute the four into the problem here and get eight. And again, that's telling me that there is a hole at four comma eight. Okay. So those are, those are the main kind of things you're looking for factoring or some other option. Once we get farther into this lesson, I'll give you a few more options on what to do. I may not do all of them with you. I might only do some just to help you think through these. The very first thing you should do before you start the problem is check the limit, okay? So if I put zero in 4x into this fraction here, I get zero plus zero over zero. I'm looking for that indeterminate form of zero over zero. If I don't get that, then this is not an indeterminate form and I don't use any of these techniques. This one I get zero over zero, so I know that means I should be able to factor or do something to the problem that will allow me to simplify it and then evaluate. So I canceled out those x's. I'm going to put zero in for that remaining x, and I get two for this limit. We're going to skip number two. I'm going to leave that to you to see if you can figure it out because it's one that we similar to what we just did on the first two screens. Okay, so now these next two involve factoring, but different types of factoring. But again, check, do you get zero over zero? So when I put zero in here, I get 16 minus 16 over zero. I get zero over zero. Okay, looks good. So I'm going to start by factoring the numerator. I'm gonna do it this factoring way. You could choose to multiply it and combine like terms as well. They both work pretty well. So my, what I mean by factoring is I see this as a difference of two squares. I see x plus 4 being the base that's being squared, and then I see 4 squared with that 16. So what I see is x plus 4 minus 4 times x plus 4 plus 4 all over x. Notice that I am rewriting the limit every single time. That's a requirement AP would get, you get marked off if you don't write that, rewrite that limit stuff. All right, so then this simplifies into x times x plus 8 over x. Now those x's cancel, and I can substitute that 0 in, and I get a final answer of 8. Again, you are welcome to multiply, so make that x squared plus 8x plus 16. You know what, let's just do it so you can see what I'm talking about. So we could do this problem differently by taking that x plus four squared and making it be eight x squared plus eight x plus 16, Oops. like that. And now you're gonna combine like terms and factor as well. So we get that 8 again. I think both of them have their positives and negatives, so you get to choose which method you like better there. Okay, this one is one that everybody tends to get wrong, not because they don't recognize that this is 0 over 0, but because they don't remember how to factor a difference or sum of two cubes. If you have your textbook, the formulas are on page 962 of the book. I'm going to do this one with you, but I can't stress enough the importance of trying to memorize how to um, factor a sum or difference of two cubes, okay? So when you factor this, the first parenthesis is just the linear pieces of it, x minus 2. And then the next part is you square the first term there. So you square x, you get x squared. Then you multiply the two things together, but you're going to make it the opposite sign. 
and then you're going to square the last term. This second thing, if you can read it, is never factorable, and the sign in the first parenthesis is always different than the sign in this spot right here, and this sign is always positive. But a really big important thing for you to remember is the fact that the this is supposed to be creating something that factors and then cancels. So you better get it so that you get something that factors, otherwise you did something wrong. All right, limit as x approaches 2, and now I am left with x squared plus 2x plus 4. And now I could just put 2 in there. 2 squared, 4 plus 4 plus 4 which is 12. Okay. So now this one, both of these require a little bit of uh, explanation as well. So this one here is also kind of a factoring problem that you could do, but you could also do it like with substitution if you don't see what could be factored. So when I look at this, here's what I see. I see that if I replace x with 2 plus h, my numerator of this thing becomes x squared minus 3x plus 2. And then I'm going to go ahead and take this part here, and I'm actually going to resolve it for h so that it becomes h equals x minus 2. So then x minus 2 goes in my denominator. And then my limit out front now can't be in terms of h because I'm in terms of x here. And I know that x is equal to 2 plus h, h is equal to x minus 2, but if h was going to 0, that means x must be going to 2. Which does make sense because that's going to get 0 in the denominator and 0 in the numerator. And now we've created something that's much easier to work with. So this becomes x minus 2 times x minus 1 cancel those things out, substitute our 2 in, and we get 1 as an answer. There's another way to do this, but I think I'll leave that for an in-class discussion. All right, this one over here, again, check. If I put 0 in for x, I get a half minus a half, right? So, and then 0 the denominator, so I definitely have to do something. This one is going to require that you get a common denominator in the numerator. So I'll do this in two steps. So my common denominator is 2 times x plus 2. So then this gets a 2 and this gets an x plus 2. And then you are very carefully going to distribute the negative to the second fraction, which means it needs to go to both terms. So when you distribute the fraction, you end up with negative x and then 2 minus 2, which is 0. So you get negative x over 2 times x plus 2. So I'm here. And then I am going to multiply by the reciprocal of my denominator so that I can clean that denominator up down there. And then actually those x's also cancel, which gives me negative 1 over 2 times x plus 2. And now I don't have the indeterminate form anymore. Now I can just substitute my 0 in, and I get negative 1 fourth. All right, how much we got here? Let's see. Oh, now we're getting some fun times here. All right, number 7. I'm not going to bore you with the details of trying to check when you put the 4 in, but the 4 does actually give you 0 in the numerator and 0 in the denominator. This is not a good candidate for factoring by grouping because I notice I've got this 11 and this 3. Nothing's going to factor out nicely. This is a great candidate for one of two division types. So you could do long division, which eh, I'm not sure I want to do that right now. Instead, I'm going to do synthetic, which may have been a while since you've done that. So this will be a good time to review it. So remember with synthetic division, you copy down the leading coefficients of, um, don't like that line there. You copy down the leading coefficients of the numerator part or what you're dividing into. And then you put outside in the little box, 
the number that you're like the, the opposite of the number that you're subtracting or adding, meaning I'm going to use positive four instead of negative four that goes in the box here. And then the process is you start by bringing down the first term. So I bring down the three and then I start multiplying and adding. So I do four times three is 12 and then I add and get one. Then I do four times one is four and I add and I get negative one. Four times negative one is negative four. I add and I get zero. That's good news because if I had something other than zero, I'd have a remainder. And this is supposed to divide. We want it to divide perfectly. So now I can go ahead and do the limit. And I have just divided by a linear into a cubic, which is going to give me a quadratic. So there is my quadratic. And I'm going to substitute 4 in. 16 times 3 is 48 plus 4 minus 1 is 51. What is happening? Ooh, that is interesting. I just put my um, calculator down on top of my keypad, and that's what happened there. Okay, 51. This problem over here is a great candidate for factoring by grouping because you can see that there are some similar terms in the numerator and some similar terms in the denominator. So remember factoring by grouping is when you take and you group two terms together and then you factor out the greatest common factor of each part. So in the first parenthesis there, I can factor out an x squared. And the second parenthesis, I can't factor out anything, but I can write the one there to remind me that um, there is a one kind of as a placeholder in that spot. And you do hope, you want to both parentheses to be the same because that's how you know the factoring by grouping is working. I'm gonna do the same thing in the denominator. So in the denominator, I'm gonna factor out an x cubed and I'm left with x minus two. And I'm gonna factor out a negative two and I'm left with x minus two. So now my numerator becomes x minus 2 times x squared plus 1. And my denominator becomes x minus 2 times x cubed minus 2. And now I can cancel. So now I can reduce those x minus 2s. And now I can substitute 2 in. So when I substitute 2 in, I get 5 over 2 cubed is 8 minus 2 is 6. So five sixths. I hope it doesn't feel like I'm going too fast, but remember you can pause and write things down as necessary. Okay, so the last thing we need to talk about is this thing called rationalization. So what this is, is basically moving your radical around. So you probably learned it in honors algebra trig, dealing with having a radical in the denominator and you didn't want it there, so you'd move it to the numerator. And that's not the only thing you can do with it. You can actually move it from the numerator to the denominator. You can move things around wherever you need them to go to make the problem work better for you. So as an example of that, here, this first problem right here, when I put 0 in for x, I get square root of 4, which is 2, minus 2, which is 0, over 0 squared, which is 0. So I have that indeterminate form of 0 over 0. So I have to do something to get rid of the to change it around. Zero over zero means something can factor or something, there's a hole someplace in the problem and I'm trying to figure out what it is. So we're going to do something that you probably also learned how to do in honors algebra two trig, and that is to multiply by, you would have called it the conjugate, but we probably dealt with it primarily with imaginary numbers. But it's really just the same thing here. So I'm gonna multiply by the opposite term of wherever the radical is. And you multiply it to the numerator and the denominator because it's like multiplying by one, so it's legal. Okay? You can't just multiply by anything unless you do it to the numerator and the denominator. And when you're doing this, what you're really doing is you're creating an already factored difference of two squares. So I've got this term minus this one, and then the same term plus the same term which means your numerator will just become each of, so what's underneath this radical in this case, so this thing squared, 
minus the second thing squared. You are, can, of course, do all of the multiplication to all the terms and cancel out all the middle terms if you'd like, but it'll always work out like this. Don't mess with the part that where you added the radical to. So in this case, we added the radical to the denominator. Don't do any distributing. Don't try and fix this in any way because it'll just make it worse and you actually want it in this factored form. All right, so here we are. We've done this work and I'm gonna save myself a line here. And I can see that that four and the negative four cancel out, which means the I can now cancel the x squareds and I'm left with one in the numerator. And since I have one in the numerator, I can now go ahead and substitute zero into the denominator. So zero in for the whole thing gives me one over, um, oh, look at, see, there's an issue right there because I didn't do copy the problem down right. And if we had been in class, somebody would have caught that and stopped me. That was supposed to be a plus. So fix that right now. Because if I hadn't fixed it, I was gonna get zero in the denominator and I'm actually supposed to get um, four. So one fourth is the final answer. All right, I think this might be the last problem. Oh, maybe one more. Um, but this is the same process, okay? So again, I'm gonna go through it kind of fast. So now I'm gonna get rid of the radical that's in the denominator by multiplying by its conjugate to both the numerator and the denominator. And I am not going to mess with the numerator this time because um, that'll just make it more complicated and I want it in a factored form anyways. And my denominator becomes four plus X minus four. And when I combine my terms, those fours go away and then I can cancel out the x's that are left over, and now I can substitute zero into what's there, and I end up with four as that answer for that problem. Okay, next. A couple different versions of the same problem here, so I am going to just quickly go through this first one. You should multiply by the square root of x plus three, over the square root of x plus three. This gives me x minus nine in the numerator, and my denominator stays as x minus nine times the square root of x plus three. And now I can cancel the x minus nines and substitute nine in for this x, which gives me one over Square root of nine is three, three plus three is six, one over six. Last problem. Okay, and again, you really should be checking to see if you're getting these in this indeterminate form, but purely by the nature of the problems, like what we're talking about, these are all going to be um, indeterminate forms. But if this were like a test, you would definitely want to be checking to see if these were in determinate forms, because if they're not, then you're wasting your time doing the process. Oops, ran out of space there in that little spot there. All right, so then I have more space now here. I get one minus I'm gonna put it in parentheses, 2x squared minus one, because I don't wanna to forget to distribute that one, that negative one, sorry. And when I distribute it, I am left with, um, let's see, one minus 2x squared plus one over this. Okay, so far not getting as close as we'd like. I am going to cancel. Nope, see, I almost did it and I already knew I wasn't going to. I have 2 minus 2x two squared over all that stuff. Oops. 
Okay, so I know I need to cancel out this x minus 1. That's what's causing the problem. So that means I have to factor something here in the numerator. I see that if I factor out a 2, then I'll have 1 minus x squared, which means I'll be able to do a difference of 2 squares. But I'm not a big fan of having it written in that form. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out a negative 2. And when I do that, I'm left with x squared minus 1. That's just my preference. You guys can do it the other way as well. And then just understand that they are opposites. Like the denominator and the numerator's pieces would be opposites of each other. All right, here we go. Sometimes the hardest part about doing these problems is there's a bunch of steps involved and you can usually see where it's headed. And so you want to skip steps and just jump to where you think it's supposed to be. Oops, this is supposed to be plus. Um, but don't get in the habit of doing that because that will not count on the AP exam or even in this class. You really have to make sure that you don't skip too many steps from beginning to end. All right, now I finally am at a point where I can substitute my 1 into the problem. So I get negative 2 times 2 in my numerator. And then my denominator is 1 plus, and when I put a 1 in here, I get 2 minus 1, which is 1. Square root of 1 is 1. I'm going to go this way so I don't have to scroll down. I get negative 4 over 2, negative 2. All that work phew, to get to negative 2. All right, hope that makes some sense. You know, you're always welcome to watch it more than once. And um, please make sure you ask any questions that you might have.